Let's jump into the six questions. The first three that I'm going to ask you, they help you figure out exactly where you are right now, and they unearth the wisdom that is contained in the last 12 months of your life and where you are right now. And the final three questions that I'm going to ask you are borrowed from transformational business consulting practices. And these last three questions are going to help you identify specifically what you need to do to move your life forward in a direction that is deeply personal and fulfilling for you. So question number one, what are the highlights from the past year of your life? I'm going to ask you that again. Question number one, what are the highlights from the past year of your life? So you're going to think back over the past 12 months, and I want you to start collecting all of the highlights from the past 12 months. Now, let me give you a few tips here. Do not do this from your memory because you will not believe how much you have forgotten. In fact, you can even test yourself on this one. Just try answering the question. What are the highlights from the past year of your life? And you can think back January, February, March. You can think to the spring, the summer, the fall, the, you know, the beginning of the winter. Think about the highlights. But if you really want to get full credit for all the highlights of this past year of your life, you want to print out the journal at melrobbins.com slash best year. And then you want to pull out your camera roll and pull out your calendar and go through the past 12 months week by week in your camera roll or on Snapchat or on TikTok. You can look at all the highlights there and you will be shocked by how much you've already forgotten. There were people you had lunch with. Forgot about that. There were day trips that you took. There were books that you read. There were places that you visited. There were trips that you took. There were things that you witnessed, stuff that you experienced. Oh, remember that outpatient surgery? Nope. Forgot about that, Mel. You're going to be shocked by how much happened to you this year that you don't even remember. So look at your camera roll when we're done with this episode. Look at your calendar and ask yourself the question, what are the highlights of this past year of my life? Now, as I do it, and I start to go through my camera roll, let's go all the way back to January. Whoa. I'm just scrolling right now. I have not done this year-end ritual yet with Chris. And so I'm explaining it to you before I even do it. And so I'm just kind of, as I'm talking to you, looking back, oh, I got a lot of photos. You're going to notice you take a lot of photos too. Um, Holy smokes. Okay. I'm going back. Whoa, we had a lot of, okay. So I'm looking back and here's some of the things. First of all, holy cow. uh, We marked the one year anniversary of this podcast. Pretty incredible. Oh my gosh, I forgot that Kendall graduated from college this year and she sang the national anthem in front of 60,000 people. I know, I know, I shared about it on the podcast, but I kind of forgot about it. There's a bazillion photos of sunsets and sunrises. And you know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of the fact that I really took peace and being present in the moment more seriously. And I can see that as a real highlight this year because of the number of photographs. Um, I see a lot of photos with new friends, and it reminds me that I was really happy in this new community. Oh, whoa. Remember the story I told you about the owl that we rescued? It happened on the night of my 27th anniversary. I talked about that incredible story of the owl that was hit by the car and rescuing it on a rainy night and holding it in my arms with a towel wrapped around it for 30 minutes. Whoa, I would have forgotten about that. Oh, this is clearly the year that I started wearing one piece bathing (laughs) suits. We opened a new studio. That was a huge win for me personally, opening the new studio for our production company. I was so scared to commit to a space and to build it out. I mean, a five-year lease, that's placing a bet on your business when you sign a five-year lease. And it really shows me that I used to think that my success was luck. And I realize now, this is a huge highlight, that that's not true. I work very, very, very hard. And signing that lease, which I took a photo of the day that we did it, that was me placing a bet on myself. And that that's a highlight. 
So why are you and I doing this? Why are you looking at the highlights? I'll tell you why. Because you need to remind yourself that your life is way bigger than how you feel in this moment. And way too often at the end of the year or in those moments when you're trying to change, you're in a temporary emotional state and you forget the full context of who you are, what you've done, all the things that you've experienced, good and bad, what you know based on all of that. And this question, what are the highlights of this past year of my life? It brings all of that wisdom right to your face and that wisdom is going to help guide you in terms of what you're gonna do in this next year of your life. All right, so that's question number one. And that's a whole lot that we've already unpacked from this past year of your life. Coming up, we've got the remaining five questions. And I'll tell you what question number two is when we return from a short break from our sponsors. Stay with me. Welcome back. I'm so glad you're here. It's your friend Mel, and I am teaching you a year-end ritual that I've done with my husband, Christopher, for the past 20 years. We now do this as a family of five. Our kids love this ritual, and I know you're going to love it too. We are jumping into the second question, and I want to remind you before we jump into the second question that you can get a free download from me. It is a journal that we have designed. It is beautiful. I am holding it in my hands right here. I can't wait for you to download this. It's at melrobbins.com slash best year. But for now, I'm just walking you through the six questions. The first question was, what are the highlights of this past year of my life? And now the second question, what were the hardest aspects of this past year? And I want you to really think about that. What were the hardest aspects of this year for you? And again, I'm going to guide you in how you can go a little bit deeper into answering this question. First of all, photos in a calendar are super, super helpful. But what also helps me with this question, because this can kind of be a big stumper, you know what I mean? And I don't want you to stay in the big themes of what was hard. I want you to get really specific and be reminded. And so have your phone out, have your photos out, have your calendar out. And I also want to share with you that I like to break this particular question into five different categories because I get much richer data. So what are the categories that you're going to think about when you think about the hardest aspect of this year? Number one, health and wellness. Number two, your career, money, school. Number three, relationships, love and friendship. Number four, fun and happiness. Number five, purpose, spirituality and meaning. Those are the big categories. And don't you worry, in the free journal at melrobbins.com slash best year, I've got all of this spelled out for you with lots of room to write and lots of prompts for you. So it's really going to help you go deeper. Now, what's interesting is that even though I just told you my highlight reel, I can see that I had some really big struggles in each one of these five areas. And yes, you may find that areas of struggle can also overlap with your areas of highlights. Like remember how I said that, oh, this was clearly the year that I started wearing one piece bathing suits <laughs> and longer shorts. Well, let me tell you why. That was a highlight, but it also highlights a struggle that I had in the category of health and wellness. And one of those struggles for me personally was menopause. I am fully in menopause. My body has profoundly changed and I struggled with it this year. And I know that, and I'll explain in a bit why unearthing struggles for you is part of the important process of figuring out what goals you're going to have moving forward. Second category, career, money, and school. This has been a year of massive highlights in my career. It has also been a huge struggle, and let me tell you why. The hyper growth of this podcast nearly killed me. In launching this podcast, it had always been a dream of mine. I shared about it a lot. Not a single person on our team has ever done the job that they're doing right now. And so we all stepped into the launch of this podcast, super excited with massive dreams. And the reality of running a show this big ran our asses over. Holy 
smokes. And it was a real struggle to stay ahead, to keep our heads above water, to respond to the demand. And I realize that sounds like an amazing problem to have, but uh, I have felt like I've been hyperventilating all year and grateful at the same time, but it's been a struggle. Are you procrastinating on YouTube again? I can help you fix that for free. I'm Mel Robbins. I'm an expert on confidence and motivation. And right now you need both. I've been there. You know what you need to do, but you're wasting time on YouTube. Stop procrastinating. Start executing by taking my free two-part training series, Make It Happen with Mel Robbins. Two video lectures taught by me, a 25-page workbook to get you in action. You deserve this. So grab your free spot with me. Just click the link, make it happen. Or you can go back to procrastinating. YouTube will be waiting, but don't you dare miss out on living the life you could be living. Make it happen. Okay, relationships, love and friendship, um, fun and happiness, both the same struggle. I spent way too much time working this year because of the success of this podcast and because we were so caught off guard. And by the way, we're hiring, so please. <laughs> if you have mad experience for a show this size, if you are absolutely, you're like, I got to work on that team. I got to be on the number five most followed podcast in the world. This is my jam and I've got the experience to prove it. We want to hear from you for real. Um, purpose, spirituality, and meaning. This is another area where highlights also overlap with struggle. Um, I mentioned that one of the highlights is seeing so many photos of sunrises and sunsets, which were a signal to me that I really tapped into a level of peace and contentment and presence living here in Vermont. But when I look back at the early part of the year, I was still new to living here. And back in January and February, Mel Robbins was lonely. She was up on this mountain staring off with a panic in her face. I can see uh, the look of struggle in her face and kind of acknowledging that and seeing it and seeing that it was a struggle, the loneliness that I felt uh, being in a new community, it's really important. And this is why looking at the hard things in your life is a critical step before you look ahead, okay? Last year, I did this exercise at the end of the year. I asked myself these six questions with my husband and our kids. And the struggle that really dominated my life 24 months ago was a deep level of betrayal that had happened in my business and in relationships in my business. And so going through the exercise and being honest with myself about that struggle led me to create goals for this year that were around addressing those issues, those issues of loneliness in my life and the issues of a lack of systems and betrayal in my business. And that's why I'm in a better place as I'm talking to you right now. That's why I feel like a totally different Mel Robbins than the Mel I see in the photos in January of February, 12 months ago, where I was still really lonely. And knowing what's hard in your life allows you to do what researchers tell you that you need to do if you want to set goals that you care about. The goals that you set need to be relevant. They need to be relevant to who you are right now, where you are right now, what's good, what's bad, what you're struggling with. Because when you make goals to improve based on what's been hard, the decades of research studies will show you that those goals then become tied to something that's personal to you. And that taps into what researchers call intrinsic motivation, which is that internal fuel that comes from deeply personal change, deeply personal meaning. If it matters to you to not be lonely again this year, you'll do something about it. If it matters to you to not be hyperventilating when you go up a flight of stairs, you'll do something about it. And that's why answering question number two and digging into your challenges is so important. Your challenges are trying to teach you something. So take this part of it seriously. What was the hardest aspect of this year for you? Maybe you lost somebody you love this year and you've been grieving. And by writing that down and unpacking it, you realize that when you look ahead, you want to give yourself permission 
to be happy again. You want to work on that sense of connection and happiness and meaning in the wake of this. And when your goals are informed by the things that you've struggled with and that you're moving through, those goals take on a richness to them, a a meaning to them. And that's why this matters so much. All right, let's jump into the third question. What did you learn about yourself this year? And again, I invite you to have your camera roll. I invite you to have your journal from melrobbins.com slash best year. I invite you to break it down into these five categories, health and wellness, career, money, and school, relationships, love, and friendship, fun and happiness. Remember that? Fun and happiness. Purpose, spirituality, and meaning. And so as you're looking at your photo roll and your calendar and you're working through the free, beautiful journal that you've downloaded, this is one of those questions that, boy, oh boy, does it help if you do this with other people? What did you learn about yourself this year? You're going to shortchange yourself. But when you do this with other people, oh, they're going to remind you. (laughs) They're going to tell you how you showed up. They're going to be your cheerleading squad. And remember that thing that you're not giving yourself credit for? Well, here are some of the big things that I learned about myself this year. And I share this with you, not only because we're friends, but also because it might stir something up in you. I learned that with regard to my health and wellness, The things that I used to do when I was younger in terms of diet and exercise, they're not going to work. They're not going to work now that my hormones have changed. If I want to feel better in my body, I need to change what I'm doing. And maybe some area of your life is like that, that all of a sudden this past year you hit a wall, that the way that you had always been showing up in your marriage, it's not working anymore. The way that you keep showing up at work, it's not leading to the promotion or the responsibilities that you want. You know, the other thing that I learned this year, I'll share another one um, that was a big kind of point of knowledge for me is that I learned a lot this year about how to not take on the responsibility of managing other people's emotional reactions and breakdowns. See, there's a big difference between supporting somebody that you care about in your life and feeling responsible for them. Supporting somebody versus being responsible for their emotions And that has been a revelation, and I loved that this was a huge thing that I learned from this past year of my life. Okay, so let's recap. Question number one, what were the highlights of this past year of your life? Question number two, what were the hardest aspects of these past 12 months for you? And question number three, what are all the amazing things that you learned about yourself this year? Maybe you're more resilient. Maybe you learned what mistakes you're not going to make again. Maybe you learned something about relationships or you learned something that made you really proud when you look back. I want you to take these three questions really seriously because this helps you again. It helps you identify that starting point. Where am I right now in my life? And it helps you get a really rich and full answer. Now, when we come back, I want you to hear a short word from our sponsors, the amazing sponsors of the Mel Robbins podcast. Help me bring this content to you for free. I love that. So take a listen. When we return, you and I are going to dig into the three remaining questions that are all grounded in a business transformation strategy that top brands use. And now you're going to use them in your life to help you chart a course forward when we return. Stay with me. Welcome back. It's your friend, Mel Robbins. And you and I are walking through a ritual that my husband, our three kids, we do this every single year. It is a year-end ritual. I also use this exact same ritual of asking myself six questions. Uh, Whenever I'm going to do any new business goals, business planning, any big pivots in my life, I absolutely love this. We've already gone through the first three questions, which were all about identifying the wisdom and the knowledge that you need so that you know exactly where you are right now. And you can now tap into all of that wisdom as we answer question four, five, and six. And what I love about questions four, five, and six is that these questions now have us looking forward. This is the set of directions that a Google Maps is going to point out because we now know where you are. Now let's talk about what do you want And where are we going? How cool is this? Okay, you ready? Cool. All right. Let's put these insights into a plan. 
for the final three questions of this year-end audit, let's borrow a very simple business and strategy planning tool. This is a tool that is used by the top global brands that you know and love. This is used by publicly traded companies. This is used by executive teams everywhere. And now, guess what? You're going to use these three questions because they are super simple. They get right to the heart of what it is that you want. And here it is. You ready? Drum roll, please. Stop, start, continue. That's it. These three questions come from a transformational business consulting practice called Stop, Start, Continue. And one of the reasons why I love these three questions, Stop, Start, Continue, is because it makes you focus on what you truly want. When you want to change or it's the beginning of a new year, it is so tempting, isn't it, to do more, to do better, to get bigger, to move faster, to change. But what about just making things simpler? What about doing more of what is working and less of what is not working? What if you focused on what you were going to continue doing in order to make this next 12 months one of the greatest years of your life? I mean, you need consistency, right? And a lot of times when we go to set goals, it's about more, better, different, ba 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 Well, what about what you're going to stop? What about those things that are the backbone of the change that you've already started initiating? Those are just as important as the big, bad, amazing new stuff you're going to do. And so let's start with question number four. What are the things that you are going to stop doing in the next year of your life? So think about the next 12 months. Let's look ahead on the road of your life. What are you going to stop doing? For me personally, I'm going to stop traveling for work. My life for the last decade has been as a road warrior. I mean, I used to be on the road 150 days a year. I basically missed out on our daughter's high school experience because I was gone. I was working. I was paying the bills. And over the past two years, I have become more and more and more committed to getting off the road and being home more. And I'm doing it. So I'm going to stop accepting speaking engagements. There's a handful that I'm willing to do if they meet certain criteria. But typically at this time of year, I would be fully booked a year ahead. There were years where I would have 120 speeches booked for the 12 months ahead. Not this year. Last year, I don't know, I did 25 maybe. You know how many I've agreed to this year? One. February, the MGM Arena, Keller Williams. Let's go, ten thousand of you. We're gonna du- we're gonna crop dust that place with motivation and tactical advice. However, I'm going to stop saying yes. I'm gonna stop saying yes to these opportunities. I'm also gonna stop saying yes to all the people that come at us and want us to create content for them. And I'm gonna focus on the project that are ours. So that's one thing that I'm going to stop doing. Another thing that I'm going to stop doing, because it's really helpful, and again, if you get your download at melrobbins.com slash best year, listing out the things you're going to stop doing in each of the five categories is going to help you gain a lot of clarity. Because I realize there's something else I need to stop doing, and that's bitching about menopause. I have spent a lot of time, and on some podcast episodes with you, Complaining about my body, complaining about my hormone changes, complaining about how stubborn it's been to try to figure out how to be healthy, complaining about hot flashes. I need to stop. I need to stop doing that and I need to have a different relationship with where I'm at with my hormones and where I am with my body. And so I want you to ask yourself this fourth question. What are you going to stop doing in the area of health and wellness? What are you going to stop doing? Career, money, school. Maybe you need to stop complaining about your job and show up differently. Maybe you need to stop complaining about the lack of money that you have and start showing up differently around it. Maybe you need to stop complaining about relationship, love, and friendship and create a different relationship. Fun and happiness, purpose, spirituality, and meaning. These five categories, what are you going to stop doing? And stopping doing something 
that can lead to massive transformation in your life. We've talked about that a lot. Sometimes it's more effective to stop doing something than it is to constantly focus on the new thing that you're going to do in some cases. And so I want you to really, really go deep on this question. That brings us to question number five. What do you want to continue doing this year? I love this question because when you make goals, goals never prompt you to think about, well, what am I going to keep doing that's working? This question is so important because it gets you out of that whack-a-mole thing. You know how you can get into these phases in your life, or at least I do, where like I'm super focused on fitness. And so I focus, focus, focus on fitness. And then I ignore my relationship with Chris. Or I'm super focused on getting out of debt. And then I ignore the fact that I need to carve out time for happiness. And so when you also take the time to answer question number five, what are you going to continue doing in the next year of your life? Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to continue doing. I'm going to continue using my let them theory. I love letting people have their emotional reactions and not managing them. I love letting people just show me who they are so I can figure out what I'm going to do in response. I love not being responsible for managing everybody else's emotional meltdowns and reactions and tantrums and childhood wounds and all that crap that we're all dealing with and just let people be human, let them have their reactions. And I love the feeling of peace and control that it gives me in my life. And the final question that's going to help you create one of the best years of your life next year. What are you going to start doing? In the next 12 months, in all five areas of your life, which again are listed in the journal, the beautiful journal that we created for you that you can print out at melrobins.com slash best year. What are you going to start doing? Well, for me, when it comes to health and wellness, thanks to Dr. G., who did the muscle-centric medicine episode with us, I am going to be strength training three days a week, period, full stop. Another thing that I'm going to start doing, you're going to love this. I'm going to start writing my next book, which is The Let Them Theory. That's right. I'm doing a whole book on it, and it's going to be incredible. I'm excited for it. I bet you're going to be excited for it too. Uh, another thing I'm going to start doing is I'm experimenting with an entirely new way of working. I mentioned earlier that I'm stopping down the work travel. Um way too much work travel last year. So I'm taking it seriously this year to change that. And we're trying out this experiment where our team has one week on where we do productions together in our new studio space in Boston. And then one week off, not like off, you're not working, but off, you are in the deep pocket doing the deeper work to get all the stuff that we did during the other week across the finish line. And I think that rhythm could be really, really cool. I'm going to start also getting aggressive about saving money again. We moved up to Southern Vermont, as you probably know, and we did a renovation project up here. And like most everybody that does a little home renovation project, we went a little over budget. And I might have gone a little over budget on our new studio build out in Boston, you know. <laughs> But now that the uh, now that our daughters are both out of college and our house project and our studio project in Boston is done, I really want to start focusing again on saving money and investing in startup companies again. And I want to remind you about something. Don't forget that starting also includes starting something that you used to do. Something that you used to do in the past. You can start it up again. Maybe you need to start listening to music again. You know how you used to love to create playlists and you always had music going in the house? Maybe that's something you want to take on this year. Maybe you want to start playing your guitar again or playing the piano again, or maybe you want to start traveling again. Even if you don't have the money to go on some big fancy pants trip, maybe it's just taking day trips and exploring where you live and going to new places. Or maybe it's time to start cleaning out your social media accounts again. You know, I'm a huge fan of what I call Unfollow Friday. And making it a point every week to align your social media accounts, the input, with accounts that match what you want the coming year to look like. Like, imagine that. Imagine if your social media didn't make you feel bad. Imagine if you took the time to align all the input you get on social media to match what you want 
to do more of this year. How cool would that be? Or maybe you want to start wearing your hair short or long again, or maybe you want to start uh, speaking French again. You know, you used to speak fluent French, but you haven't done it in 10 years. And so you want to really brush up on the language again. So again, what do you want to start doing? You want to start being more visible at work? You want to start taking classes to up-level your skills? Go through every one of the five areas of your life and identify what you want to start doing. Welcome back. It's your friend, Mel. I am so thrilled that you are here. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here with me. I'm so glad I get to teach this to you. I'm sharing the four lessons that I learned after auditing what has been one of the craziest years of my life. And I just shared the first lesson, which is drop the sword. Has to do with happiness. Now, let's talk about the second lesson. The second lesson is this. Forget about balance. Focus on boundaries. Like you, I have always been in the pursuit of trying to balance work, life, time for myself, and I'll tell you, last year was the year that I finally realized, Mel, screw balance. You need boundaries. See, here's the thing about balance. Especially if you want to be happier, you think, oh, I need balance, I need balance. Well, balance is something you wish for. Boundaries are what you need to create. And Another insight that I had about balance is that if you're busy seeking balance, you know what ends up happening? You literally put every part of your life in competition with every other part of your life because the word balance presumes that everything in your life has equal weight. Otherwise, it won't balance, right? Well, that's just not true. And here's what I've discovered, that seeking balance as a way to be happier or a way to have everything, it actually creates resentment in your life. For example, if work is really demanding, let's say you love your job, but it's been really demanding, and then you start to feel like your life is out of balance, what happens? You start to resent work. Or if you come home from work, and even though you're seeking balance, you're exhausted, and your kids just want to do something that you don't want to do, what do you do? You resent your kids. And here's why I love boundaries, because boundaries requires you to be responsible for how everything in your life will fit together. And boundaries get created based on, well, what is my top priority and what are my needs in the moment? See, boundaries are an active choice. Boundaries require you to be self-aware. They require you to get in touch with what you value. And here's my biggest insight about really focusing on boundaries this year. Your boundaries are not for other people. They're not for anybody else. You create boundaries for you. I want to say this again. Your boundaries are for you. Because boundaries are where you are saying yes and where you say no. Boundaries highlight what's important to you and what's not important to you. And here's the other big takeaway I learned about boundaries. People are not mind readers. Boundaries only work if you're willing to communicate them. And so I'm going to give you two examples of how I just started forgetting about balance and I started focusing on boundaries and how that helped me create a better life and achieve goals during this year where there's so many things going on. It was so crazy. Balance was a freaking joke and trying to pursue it made me miserable. And by the way, great boundaries, this is what's crazy, make your life feel as though it's more in balance because with boundaries, absolutely everything can fit in in a way that it's supposed to fit in based on what's important to you. So let me give you an example. So one of my goals for this past year was to be more present with my family. Why? Because this was a year about healing and happiness. So I created a boundary with myself, and here it is. Mel, when you're home or you're with your family, your phone is not on your body. That was my boundary. So if we were out as a family, my phone is in my bag. If I'm at home, do you know where my phone is? It's either in my bathroom plugged in or it is in the kitchen plugged in. And look, if you've listened to this podcast or you followed me on social media for a long time or you've seen me speak at a big corporate event, you know that I have really good boundaries already with my phone because I don't sleep with it. I don't have it near me. I keep it in a different room. And I have that boundary in place so that I can get up in the morning and put myself first and have a great morning routine. But this year, I took boundaries with my phone up an entirely new notch. I just don't have it on me when I'm with my family. And you want to know what? It works. I feel like I spent a lot of time with my family. And you want to know the truth? I didn't spend any more time or less time with my family than I did the year before. I was just present during the time I was with them because of the boundary. 
And there's a lot of powerful research here. In fact, I think we need to do an entire episode on this. There's this thing that everybody's talking about, and there's a big New York Times article about it. It's called fubbing, a.k.a. phone snubbing. So just combine the word phone with snubbing for fubbing, okay? It basically means you are snubbing the people that are sitting there right around you in real life when you are standing next to them and you're looking at your phone. And here's the interesting thing about the research. Studies show that phone snubbing makes the people around you feel like they're being ostracized by you, and they also start to distrust you. And another study shows that if you start fubbing or snubbing people with your phone, it can lead to this ripple effect when you're with your family or your friends. And I bet you've experienced this. Let's just say that, you know, Chris is on his phone and I'm kind of waiting to talk to him. And I start to feel like, oh my God, he's ignoring me. He's like standing next to me and he's busy scrolling through social media. So what do you end up doing? You just pick up your phone and you start scrolling too. Well, this year I did not do that, at least not as much as I used to. And I'll tell you, this boundary was so cool because it made me realize how great it is to be more present with the people that you love and how often it's just the damn phone that keeps you from doing it. And the truth is, it would never have happened without a boundary. If I had just said, I need balance between work and home, it wouldn't have happened. I'm going to give you another example because boundaries are so powerful. I set another boundary with my health. So I am really committed to improving my gut health and balancing my hormone health. And, and you may already know this, but in case you don't, I am in the throes of menopause and I feel like my body is changing because it is changing. And all the things that I used to do in terms of my habits and what I eat and how I exercise, they're just not working. And I'm freaking frustrated by it. And like you, every single time we have a great expert on the Mel Robbins podcast, I learn so much. And I want to give a shout out to Dr. Amy Shaw, because I learned so many amazing things about gut health from her. She appeared three different times on the Mel Robbins podcast. And one of the favorite things that she taught me was the research around caffeine, adenosine, and the brain, and also the research about how your estrogen like absorption for hormone health has a ton to do with your gut health. And when I learned all this, it inspired me to create a boundary with coffee in the morning. I know, sounds weird, just hear me out. But I used to be the kind of person that when I would wake up, I would drag myself, like army crawl my way to the coffee maker. I would slam a cup of coffee before anything else hit my lips. I don't do that anymore because of science. Now I wake up, I drink 16 ounces of water first thing in the morning, and I have a boundary. I do not have coffee until at least 90 minutes into the day, oftentimes later. And I usually only have coffee with breakfast, not on an empty stomach. And on most days, that's the only cup of coffee I have. And I got to tell you, this is a huge positive change for me. I used to drink four to five cups of coffee a day. And with these changes... I do feel healthier. I do feel less bloated. And the crazy part is I feel more energized and focused with just one cup of coffee because of the science and because of adenosine. Now, if you want to learn more about this research and you missed the one where she was talking about it, just follow this podcast because the very next episode that I'm releasing is about the eight small habits that I learned from experts on the Mel Robbins podcast over the past 12 months. And we share that amazing research from Dr. Amy Shaw in the episode that's coming next. All right. Speaking of coming next, let's hit the pause button. I want you to hear a word from our sponsors because they allow me to bring you not only this podcast, but all the things that we do at zero cost. I love our sponsors. So take a listen. And when we come back, I'm going to be waiting for you and I'm going to be ready to tell you the final two lessons that I learned the hard way so you don't have to. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. It's your friend, Mel. I'm so glad you're here because I got two more lessons to teach you from one of the craziest years of my life. So just to quickly recap, the first one was about happiness, dropping the sword and allowing more happiness in. The second lesson that we just covered was forget balance, focus on boundaries. Okay. Third lesson. Ooh, I love this one. You ready? frustration is a very good thing. Yep, I said it. 
Frustration, this is a lesson, a big lesson I learned this year. Frustration is not a sign that things are terrible. Frustration is a sign that you're growing. <laughs> and I have to kind of laugh as I share this lesson with you because, I mean, if you think about what I was saying in the beginning, I told you that I always have to learn things the hard way. And one of the reasons why these lessons feel so hard to me is because I always feel so frustrated about some aspect of my life right before I get it. And what I'm realizing is, of course you do, Mel. It's hard to learn life lessons because you feel frustrated and you're frustrated because you're growing. You hadn't gotten the lesson yet. And so here's the takeaway that I just want to hand to you like a gigantic gift. Frustration is a good thing because it just means you've outgrown some aspect of your life. And you're not meant to stay in a place or a situation or in a system that no longer suits you. That's why you're frustrated. And before the break, remember that I said I was frustrated with my body because all the habits that I had in my 40s were no longer working now that I'm in menopause? Well, frustration is just a sign that I've outgrown the habits that I had in my 40s. And now that I'm in my 50s, I need to up-level my habits. That's all that it means. Hey, it's Mel. I want you to stop thinking about what you want and actually do something about it. What can you do? Jump into my new free training called Make It Happen. This training gives you the tools. It's packed with science. It comes with a free workbook. It's exactly what you need right now. More than half a million people are taking it. You have the power to change your life. Together, let's make it happen. All you got to do is click on the link in the caption, melrobbins.com slash make it happen. It's free. I created it for you. Why wouldn't you take it? Don't miss out on the life you could be living. Let's make it happen together. This lesson is critical. I want you to think about the five main areas of your life. Health and wellness, career, money, and school, relationships, love, and friendship, fun and happiness, purpose, spirituality, and meaning. Anytime you feel frustrated with your health or work or school or money or with any relationship or even with the sense of just that something's missing, you know, that sense of not having purpose. Let me tell you, that frustration that you're feeling is good. You're not going to stay stuck there. You only have frustration because you've outgrown something. That's it. So stop making it so personal. Stop telling yourself you're broken. You're not broken. You've just outgrown something. And when you make frustration personal, like something's wrong, something's wrong. No, something's got to change. Stop aiming it at yourself. Frustration is just a signal that something isn't working. And boy, I have felt frustrated most of this year. And looking back, I now know why. And it's kind of ironic that I felt frustrated on the year I was working on healing and happiness, but it is what it is. Here's why I felt frustrated. Because this was a year of hyper, hyper, hyper growth for me, especially at work. And so let's apply the lesson. If you think about frustration as a good thing, that's kind of step one. Now what you can do is you can look for what is the opportunity to grow. I want you to follow a method that I use. I created this. I call it the three Ps. You ready? The three Ps stand for project, process, people. So in any area of your life where you're frustrated, number one, turn this into a project. Do not make this personal. Frustration is a sign. You've outgrown something. So you're going to turn it into a project, okay? Number two, you're going to ask yourself, okay, what process is broken? And a process is the way in which you're doing something. It could be the way you communicate. It could be the way that you organize yourself at work. It could be the way that you operate in a meeting. It could be any process that you're in. And there is a process when you're frustrated that you have been following that just no longer works for you. It doesn't match where you're going. That's why you feel frustrated because the process is stunting something about your growth. The third P, I want you to look around at the people that you're around. And here's the catch. The most important person in the equation when you're frustrated is you. And so you're going to ask yourself, am I frustrated because I've outgrown the people that I'm around or am I frustrated because I've outgrown the dynamic? So let me give you a personal example. 
So our daughter Kendall just flew home from Los Angeles literally yesterday, and she's 23, and she and I are so similar. And if you listen to any of the family episodes, particularly the one where we shared four secrets of a successful relationship, what I learned from a fight with my daughter, um, that's the one where you were like uh, laughing at each other, you're like fighting like this and whispering so that we didn't rah, 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 rah. Well, sure enough, she was here for about an hour and we were already at each other. And I am so frustrated by our dynamic. It has been this way for years. Here's what it means. It just means that there's something that I need to shift in the process of how the two of us interact with one another. And guess what? If I focus on myself, there are so many things that I can do. I can drop the sword, right? So I can stop bracing, which shifts the energy, which softens me. I can use the let them theory. That's a great way not to get pulled into the dynamic and to create space for something else. Here's another example of an area that I've been frustrated with. Work. I worked way too much this year. I talked a lot about this, but let me just share a little bit. I never expected the podcast to be this successful out of the gate. I mean, it was not like the big goal. My goal this past year was like happiness and, and healing. I was not like, I'm going to work like crazy and dominate and pot. That, that, that's not what happened. And the truth is, I even feel bad feeling frustrated about it because I love this podcast. I love working with my team on this podcast. I love talking to you twice a week. And I hate that it has been very frustrating. And before I tell you why it was frustrating, I want to make sure I thank you because all of this runaway success is because of you and because of our team, but it's mostly because of you. You made the Mel Robbins podcast the number five most followed podcast of the entire year on all of Apple Podcasts. It's your shares, your listens, the amount of time that you have spent with me. I mean, this doesn't happen. What you did, this is unheard of because this is not a celebrity show. There are not famous people stopping by here promoting their stuff. And I'm not a famous sports figure dating the world's biggest pop superstar talking to my brother. I love those guys. But I'm like a 55-year-old mother of three. And I'm not trying to undersell myself. I know I've done amazing things. But I never launched my own podcast. I know how come I didn't expect this level of success. And I'll tell you, there have been times this year where it has been exhilarating. It is so exhilarating to be 55 years old and trying things you've never done. It is so exhilarating to be this creative. It is so exhilarating to make an impact in your life. And you know what else it's been? Freaking frustrating. Crazy, frustrating, and overwhelming to work like 90 hours a week for an entire year, especially when I had made a commitment to heal and be happy. It's crazy frustrating to feel like you're always behind, to feel like you're always reinventing the wheel, to constantly be trying to figure things out because you've actually never done this before. And what I know is that any place that you're frustrated, this is a huge lesson this year, over and over and over again, I would say to myself, it's not you. Stop aiming this. I'm not frustrated with myself. I am frustrated with the feeling like I know I need to upgrade how I'm working. Remember what I said at the top? You have to slow down. If you're in a moment in your life where you're frustrated about something, you feel like you're getting run over by your marriage or the situation with your parents or work or school, you have to slow down. Because when you slow down and you stop making this personal and you stop punishing yourself, what you will realize is exactly what we have realized, that our small but mighty amazing team has completely outgrown all of the processes and systems that we use to launch the podcast. Recognizing frustration as a sign of growth allows you to step back, allows you to be strategic instead of emotional. It allows you to solve a problem. That's what we've done. It's why we've opened these new studios in Boston. In fact, you might have even heard a little while ago <laughs> some of the construction that's happening outside because we haven't even soundproofed the room yet. Yeah, I thought it'd be so cool to be in this really cool area of Boston, and I kind of forgot, you know, Mel, Boston's not exactly Vermont, uh, where our studio is in a place above my garage where I only need to worry about when Mike, the UPS driver, pulls in and our dog YOLO goes bananas here. <laughs> Holy cow, there are buildings going up everywhere. But whatever. And knowing that 
I don't have to see frustration as a sign that we're failing. I can see frustration as a sign that we're growing. And this is a really important lesson for you to embrace, particularly at work and when you're learning something new. Because when you're learning something new or you're in a hyper growth period in work or with your side hustle, you will feel like you're out over the tips of your skis. And it can make you feel like I'm not good at this. I'm screwing this up. I do not want you to think about it that way. Instead, here's the lesson. The next time you're frustrated, think, oh, wait a minute. Okay, I'm frustrated because I don't have the support and the systems that I need to get me where I'm going. So how do I take a step back and slow down and create the systems and support that will represent where I want to get to, not where I am right now? And by the way, exact same lesson in your life. Think about habits. What are habits? Habits are just systems and processes in your life that you repeat. So if, for example, you're frustrated with your health and you're frustrated with your inability to stick to things that you want to do to make yourself healthier, instead of aiming that at yourself like you're some loser that's never going to get this right, forget that. You just have outgrown the systems and processes that you use. That's it. It's not about you. It's about the systems. Maybe uh, you need a different process for how you buy groceries, how you stock the fridge. Maybe you need different foods in there. Maybe you need to adopt one of my favorite all-time processes when it comes to making a new habit stick. Write it on a post-it note, stick it on your mirror. Maybe you need a new morning routine. That's a process, by the way. It's a process you follow every single morning. If yours no longer supports you, don't worry about it. In fact, in a few episodes, I'm gonna hammer you about what you need to do every morning and I'm gonna help you make it easier. Here's the bottom line. When you feel frustrated, good, good. It's a sign that you're growing. It's a sign that you need to update systems. It's a sign that you need to either change the people you're around or change the way you're around the other people. Now, goal setting, it sounds simple, right? You just set a goal, then you go after it. Mm -mm. Goal setting is something that I screwed up for years. I was the poster child of making resolutions and of being all talk no walk. I was part of the 81% of people that had bailed on my resolutions by the time January 1st rolled around. That is, until I dug into the research, read the books, studied the experts, and figured out how you set goals and do it right according to what research has to say. And I want to talk to you about this today because I am getting an avalanche of questions and messages about setting goals and breaking and making new habits, like this one from Dave. Hey Mel, this is Dave. I'm wondering if you can talk about goal setting and how they do it right. There's a lot of talk about resolutions and goals, especially with the new year coming up. And in the past, I've had a hard time setting them and achieving goals. Could you give me any tips? First, I wanna to say to you, Dave, thank you for this question, because you're not the only one that has a hard time setting and achieving goals. And I'm not only going to give you tips, today we are going to have a master class in gold setting. In fact, I am so excited by the number of you that are looking for information about ways to set and achieve goals this year that I've decided we're going to do something a little different. For the next month or so, you and I are going to dig into the most foundational and important building blocks that you need in order to create lasting change in your life. These are the topics that I have been researching and teaching around the world. These are the topics that I write about in my books and in our audio projects with Audible. This is what I have been studying for years. And so here's what we're going to do. And I am so excited about this. For at least the next month, all of the coming episodes are going to be master classes, toolkits, 101s on the most important topics when it comes to personal development, success, happiness, creating a better life. Today, we're going to dive into goal setting, but then we're going to jump right into habits, mindset, anxiety, relationships, mental health, healing your nervous system and trauma, confidence, boundaries, happiness, meaning, and purpose. Why? Well, because these are the foundational pillars to create a better life. And when you understand these topics and the latest research, most importantly, you have simple tools that you can apply immediately to your own life. That's a game changer. And so that's what we're going to be doing in every single episode. Why? Well, change is 
always going to be hard. Always. I'm not going to lie to you about that. But neuroscience, academic research, and other people's personal experiences can provide unbelievable insights into how, when, and why behavior change efforts on your part can succeed or fail. And I want you to have all of this and be able to use it to your advantage. I already mentioned that 81% of people give up on their goals. Well, guess what? That's not going to be you because you, my friend, are going to have the science, the tools, the strategies, the shortcuts to not only making change happen, but making it stick. And so this awesome series that we are programming and bringing to life for you is going to begin today with the topic of goal setting. Because one of the things that I know based on the research is that no change will last in your life if it's not personally connected to you. And no goal will be achieved if you don't have a connection to why you want to achieve it. And so I figured if we're going to do a big series that's going to give you the foundational aspect and most recent research around changing your life, we better start with an episode where you identify personal, relevant, and achievable goals that you're excited about. That way, every single other episode that you hear in this series for the next month or so, it's going to help you achieve something that really matters to you. And the fact is, goals matter. According to the research, and you probably have experienced this when you have been working on goals, goals matter because number one, they make you happier. Number two, they suppress negative emotions. And in fact, based on some groundbreaking research out of the University of Wisconsin, having goals that you're working on can even suppress feelings of fear and depression. I mean, that's pretty cool. Third, goals give you a sense of purpose, meaning, and being up to something. In fact, I just had a conversation with our daughter, Sawyer, who was saying that she's kind of in a rut. She's like, I just feel like my life is the same old, same old. Like every day is the same damn day. And it's only gotten worse because she works remote and she's worked remote for over a year and a half since she first interned for the company she works for as a senior in college. She's almost never gone into the office. No holiday parties, no nothing in person. Every day she sits at her desk at home and works virtually. She hangs out with her roommates who she loves, but it's like the same thing in and out. You want to know what's going to fix this? Goals. Because when you have goals, it interrupts the day-to-day -day doldrum. It gives you something to look forward to. It makes you feel like something cool is happening. And that leads me to the fourth benefit. Life is harder when you have no goals. Based on the research, having goals makes your life feel easier. And I think even just that little story I just told you about my daughter feeling like she's in a rut, you can see that when you're in a rut, life is hard. When you feel stuck, when things are monotonous, it's hard. When you got something that excites you, something that you're working toward, that's pretty awesome. And that's why we, you and me, we are going to start with your goals because they matter. And what also matters is how you set them. Because if you don't set goals the right way, based on science, you fail before you even start. And that was Mel Robbins for years. So think of this episode as a comprehensive toolkit that will help you make goals that are going to keep you inspired, that you can achieve, that are going to make you feel excited about the year ahead and what you're up to. And I have one promise to share with you. You're not only going to learn a lot today, by the time this episode is done, you're going to have identified between one and three goals. And you're going to do it with me side by side as I identify one to three goals for myself. And we are also going to apply the latest research every single step of the way. And I want to share that up front because I expect your goals to change from the beginning of this episode until the very end, because you are going to be applying the research all the way through this episode. By the end of our conversation, you're not only going to have defined these goals, you will have refined them and you will have taken steps toward them. How freaking cool is that? So make sure you listen all the way to the end because we are going to cover a ton of ground today. So let me just preview what you're going to learn today. We're going to start by unpacking really exciting research that's pretty recent out of the University of Oregon that simplifies goal setting into two major components of what makes up a goal. 
And if you don't have these two major components present when you set your goals, you will fail. Seeing this study made me realize why I have failed in the past at setting certain goals. I'll tell you those stories because I think that they're going to help you. But this is really exciting stuff because it's super simple and there's so much research here. Second, as you begin to identify the goals using these two components that we're going to unpack, I'm going to walk you through the five mistakes that everybody makes that prevent you from achieving your goals. And you're not going to make these mistakes because now that you got your goals identified based on the University of Oregon research, we're going to make sure we refine those goals using the five mistakes so that you can avoid the pitfalls that I know I've fallen into. And step by step by step, we are going to support you. I, I'm so excited for this episode, honestly, because I'm going to do this with you. And you're also going to learn about a widely reported study regarding whether or not you should talk about your goals. This is a study that people cite all over the place that has been debunked. And I will tell you the new research related to whether or not you should ever talk about your goals. Okay, cool. You ready? I got to take a breath because there's a lot we're going to do. Whew. Really, really excited about this. I love goals. And I also love this recent research that I found from Dr. Elliot Berkman at the University of Oregon. Now, Dr. Berkman is the co-director of the Center for Translational Neuroscience, and he studies the motivational and cognitive factors that contribute to success or failure at achieving goals. I mean, he's figured this out for both of us. How cool is this? And when you hear this research, this is kind of one of those studies where you're like, well, that makes a hell of a lot of sense. Why did nobody tell me this? So first, let's start with his definition of a goal, okay? Dr. Berkman's definition of a goal is this. A goal is any desired outcome that wouldn't otherwise happen without you doing something. Let me unpack this. This is kind of illuminating, okay? So a goal is any desired outcome that wouldn't otherwise happen without you doing something. So I'll give you an example of a goal. Let's say that this was the year that you're like, that's it, I'm getting six-pack abs this year. If you have a goal of getting six-pack abs, you have to do something different. That's why it's a goal. If you have a goal of getting out of debt, for example, you have to do something to make that goal happen. Let me give you an example of what is not a goal. Watching that series that you're addicted to right now for my family, it's Gangs of London. Uh, I don't have to do anything different to watch the series Gangs of London. You see how that's not a goal? The reason why it's not a goal is there is zero resistance. There is zero change. There's zero that I have to do differently. Goals naturally contain friction and resistance because they require you to do something new. Now that might sound obvious, but if you don't get that a goal is going to require you to push through some kind of resistance, you're going to fail at setting them. They're going to be way too easy, okay? So let's start applying this to your life right now. I want you to think about an area of your life that you would like to improve or where you want to set a goal. So just stop and think about the coming year. What is an area of your life that you want to improve or where you want to make a new goal? I have three that I'm going to share with you. And one of my goals for the coming year is in the area of free time and hobbies and having fun. A second goal of mine is going to impact my health in a positive way. And the third is about my mindset and focus and clarity. So I'm going to unpack these and just, I invite you to listen along. And as I'm explaining my goals, think about what you're inspired to change, where you're willing to do something different. So I'm going to start with number one, hobbies and having more fun. I really want to spend more time. One goal of mine this year is to spend more time gardening. I just love gardening, not vegetables. I like flowers, landscape. And I want to make sure a goal of mine this year is that I spend more time gardening. That's one goal. Now, a second goal that I have for this year is related to my health. And I want to stop drinking for a while this year. 
And I can get into more as we unpack this and go through the research, but that's a goal of mine to, to really just knock off the booze for a bit. And third is about my mindset. I want to get back, this is a goal of mine, to a consistent journaling practice every single morning. There are things that I do every single morning that have zero resistance. I don't even have to think about it. I roll out of bed when the alarm rings, no resistance. I high five the mirror every morning and set an intention. I have no resistance. I have a cup of coffee every morning, no resistance. I typically move my body most mornings, no resistance. But something that I really want to make a goal of mine is having a consistent journaling practice every single morning. That, that, that would be pretty cool for me. So I want you to now stop and think about you. What are goals that you have for the coming year that are going to require you to do something different in order to make this goal happen? Now, I want to stop for a second because I want to address something that you may be thinking right now because it's a question I'm seeing a lot. Hey, Mel, how do I set my goals if I can't determine what my goals are? I absolutely love this question. And by the way, it's super common to have no idea what you want. And I'm going to give you a number of research-backed strategies that you can use to kind of cut through the uncertainty or the overwhelm or the fog in your brain and identify at least one goal by the end of this podcast that is personal and motivating to you. But I also want to talk about something that gets in a lot of people's way other than just not being sure what your goal should be, and that's perfectionism. If you're the kind of person that is constantly aiming for these crazy high and unattainable goals, that's very demotivating because super high goals, unattainable goals, what happens is you don't achieve those. And so you start to feel like a failure. And perfectionism can get in your way of setting goals because you start to figure, well, if you don't set a goal, then you can't fail. Perfectionism, according to the research around goal setting, looks a lot like this. You set goals, but then you give up before you start. Or you want to set goals, but you burn all your time just kind of analyzing and analyzing and analysis paralysis. Or you also just avoid the situations where you feel like you're going to fail. So here's an example. You are really wanting to take your health seriously this year. And you set a goal of going to the gym every single day and exercising for two hours a day. And like, you literally fail before you even start because you're trying to get it perfect. And we're going to address that. Don't you worry. So whether you're dealing with brain fog or you're dealing with perfectionism, this is super common to not really know what your goals are. So let's talk about the research, okay? These are prompts that are going to help you to relax and to dream a little bit and to lean into goals that are really going to make a difference in your life because I want you to have goals. They really matter. So number one, it's really important that you make sure that your goals are really aligned with your dreams. And if you can't come up with any goals that really inspire you, this is going to sound counterintuitive, but I want to invite you to think even bigger. If you allow yourself to start dreaming again, then what you and I can do, if you can identify the dream, is you and I can then use the research to scale that big, awesome dream of yours back and turn it into small, achievable goals. This is based in research. And so I invite you, if you don't know what you want, allow yourself to dream big again. And then we'll get into the research about how to make that big dream a smaller goal. Now, here's a second tip. And this one's a little morbid, but it tends to work. If you don't know where to start, think about the end, like the real end, your death. When you think about the fact that at some point, this amazing thing called life comes to an end. What do you want to have achieved in your life? When you think about it in reverse, trust me, you're not going to wish that you spent more days at work. You're going to wish that you spent more time outside or more time with family. You're going to wish that you did pick up the guitar. You're going to wish that you did 
take on some of the goals that are buried deep within your heart. And so if you truly feel stuck, think about your own death. Research shows that it prompts you to get in touch with what matters to you. Now, you could also, if that doesn't float your boat, you can also just get quiet. And this is based in powerful research. Basically, mindful individuals are way better at setting the right goals for themselves. And I personally believe that one of the reasons why is that when you have a mindfulness practice, whether it's a meditation practice or heck, just get out in the woods for a walk. Have you noticed that if you ever take a long walk on a beach, that by the end of that 30-minute stroll, you've worked out a lot of your problems in life because you've gotten quiet? If you get quiet, you can hear the most important sound in the world, and that's your own voice. And that matters when it comes to goal setting, because the best goals are those goals that are personally relevant, meaningful, and enjoyable to you. Now, researchers have a term for this. They call goals that are personal to you self-concordant goals or want-to goals. This comes from researchers at Carleton University. I like to call these goals personal goals. Getting in touch with yourself helps you set these kind of concordant goals. They are not goals that you feel pressure to do out of obligation. I think we've all taken on those goals, right? Where you're like, all right, everybody's getting in shape. Oh, everybody's doing Whole30. Oh, everybody's doing this. Guess I better do that too. Those kind of goals don't work because you're not interested in those goals. You want goals that are in touch with something personal to you. And here's another really interesting little hack that really works. You're going to use the third person. So using a third person perspective, according to research at Cornell, can help you identify and achieve personal goals better. And so now I'm going to turn it back to you again. And I want you to use the third person research from Cornell. I'm going to use it first. And then I do want you to say your goals out loud. Okay. I've already shared my goals, but let's Let's make these Cornell University style goals, okay? And let's do the third person. Mel would really love to spend more time gardening this year. You know, it feels kind of funny when you say that. It's almost like it's happening. (laughs) Now you say it. What would you love to do? Say it in the third person in your name. Here's another one of mine. Mel has a goal to not drink at the beginning of this year. It sounds like more authoritative. It, it really, you got to try this. It's so wacky how this works. Mel, you know that Mel? She would love to get up every day and have a rock solid journaling routine. It's weird how that Cornell University works. And now it's your turn. Use the third person. Take a minute, hit pause, and say what you want out loud. Go ahead. It's kind of weird, isn't it, when you use your own name? And look, it's okay if it's super general. Mine are really general. Did you notice that? My goals right now, they're just things I kind of want to do. I want to journal. I want to not drink for a couple months. And I want to spend more time gardening. But by the time this episode is done, you and I are going to refine these general statements, these goals, using research. And so let's dig into this exciting research that I promised to talk about from the University of Oregon. So here's the most important thing about goals. And I love this study because it boils goals down into two things that have to be present. If these two components of a goal are not present, you're not doing shit when it comes to this goal. I have experienced this in my life. You have experienced this. And I can't wait for you to hear this. So the two components to achieving any goal is that there must be what researchers call the will and the way. The will of any goal refers to the motivational and emotional aspects of the behavior change. In other words, the why. The will is the why of behavior change. So let me ask you a couple questions that researchers kind of unpacked in this study that are going to help you really clarify the why when it comes to the goals that you're thinking about as you and I are talking right now. 
Why is the behavior change important to you? Why do you want to change? Why now? And I'm going to go through these and I'm going to use one of my goals, gardening. Why is the behavior change important to you? Well, it's important to me, this goal of spending more time this year gardening, because I love gardening. And I've talked a lot on this podcast about how I am addicted to being busy and it causes a lot of stress. And when I'm out in the garden, it's super relaxing. It's really creative. I love growing flowers from seed. I love cutting flowers and bringing them in. The second question, why do you want to change? I want to change because I want to be present more in my life. I want to change because I want to get serious about having more fun and being more creative. And this third question, why now? Why now? Why is this a goal now in your life? Well, for me, why now is because I just feel called to do it. I feel like if I'm ever going to break this addiction to being busy and I'm going to find more time to truly enjoy my life, I have to get serious about making that change now. Like, why wait? And so I feel called to do it. So that's the first part. And I want you to ask those questions of yourself for any goal you want to set. Why is the behavior important to you? Why do you want to change? Why now? And if you don't have an answer to those questions, that goal that you're thinking about will not work because the will to do it, the motivation, the why, it's not going to be there because it's not personal to anything to you. Now let's talk about the second component, okay? The second component in this study from the University of Oregon is the way. And the way refers to the cognitive and informational aspects of the behavior change. I call this the how. The way is the how of behavior change. And so let me walk you through those questions. How is this behavior change going to unfold? What skills and capacities does it require? What is the specific plan for doing it? And for me, the behavior change that's going to unfold is I am going to study how to create a cutting garden. I'm going to build my own like little, what are they called? Like raised bed thingies that you kind of put the thingies in. I'm going to learn about uh, cultivating flowers from seeds. What skills and capacities does it require? Um, well, a lot <laughs> for me. What is the specific plan? Uh, I'm in the middle of creating the plan. And I think you can start to see as you ask yourself these questions about the goal that you have. How's this behavior change going to unfold? What skills and capacities does it require? What is the specific plan for getting this done? I think you can see that if you don't identify the how, that change ain't happening. Because willpower alone, motivation alone, it's not enough. You got to have, according to the research, both the why and the how in order to be successful at changing behavior. And so the takeaway here, based in science, is that any goal requires two things. There must be a will and a way, a why and a how. And here's why this is really interesting. Neuroscience has revealed that your brain system involved in those two sides of the behavior change are entirely different from one another. So for example, the how you're going to make this goal a reality, that's all the brain circuits that are involved in executive functioning, including your prefrontal cortex, among other areas of the brain. The why, on the other hand, is the dopaminergetic, I can't even say it, that's why I can't say it. it's the dopamine reward system within the brain. That's the why. And you need both. You need to tackle the how, which is having the know-how, the skills, the plan, the push, and you also got to have the why. And the why is what comes into play when you know what to do, but you can't do it. It's how you hack the motivation. And what studies reveal is that this is hard because new behaviors, they're rarely as motivating. As much as we may love to make a plan and you may love to buy a new journal, or I used to love to buy a new 
planner. You know, when you buy a new calendar for the new semester and it feels like the new you, I just uh, loved the planning part. Have you ever had that experience where you're all excited to go to the gym? You're all excited to try this new routine. You're all excited for this new habit. And the day one that comes, huh, no motivation at all. I mean, it makes sense because why would you want to try that new hit exercise when you know that watching Netflix, something you do all the time, is way more enjoyable? That's why having both is super important. You cannot just have the why you want to do it with no plan. That doesn't work. And you also can't have a plan and have no reason why you want to get it done. And when you really stop and think about your goals this way, having a why and a how, it's what's going to get you excited. And if you're somebody that continues to make goals, but you constantly give up on them, I'm going to tell you something right now. Those goals are not linked to something that you value, to a core belief. And the second that you make that link and you make these goals personal, holy cow, you will be unstoppable. So we've covered the two components of goals based on the research at University of Oregon. I've asked you to walk through the questions of the why and the how about the goals that you're starting to set. And I want to say something right now. If you're starting to feel like the things you wrote down in the beginning are not the goals that you want, that's great. You may change things up completely from the beginning of this episode, the middle of the episode, and the end of the episode. That's the point of this. Listening to research is not going to change your life. Applying the research will. So please, as you're gaining insight and as you're taking this and as you're taking these tools that I'm sharing with you and you're applying them to the way that you're thinking about your own goals for the next year, please allow yourself to change. Please allow yourself to modify the goals because that is going to help you achieve them. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe. Mwah.